We come to you in the name of Jesus, through the mercy throne, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray even now that you would join us here to hear your word and speak to our hearts individually, God. Even things that I don't say, but your spirit wants to say, encourage and minister and heal and forgive and do your work, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, it's such an honor and a privilege to be back with you. I was sick last week. That influenza A is some nasty stuff. Then I, I didn't even know I was sick for a while. I hope I didn't give it to anybody. But then I got strep throat. It's going around. I heard there's epidemics in school. How many of you have had a family member or a close friend, something that's been real sick? Raise your hand. A lot of sickness going around. I pray that God will give you strength and give you health and that you will live in his abundance. And I'm so thankful for feeling better today. And uh, praise the Lord. Well, we come to the last sermon in James' book, chapter 5, verse 13. And if you don't have your Bible, you can read along on the screen. I'm reading the NIV. Is anyone among you troubled? Any one of you in trouble? It says afflicted in the King James. He should pray. Is anyone happy? Or the King James says, Mary, let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? He said, call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And uh, oils were special then. There were oils they used, uh, healing oils. So I think medicine's represented there, but even more so, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is not here physically, is he? He's gone to be with the Father, but he sent his spirit, and he's saying it's Jesus that does it. It's the touch of God. Jesus touches us by his spirit. And the prayer, look at this, verse 15, offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. Notice that. The Lord will the one that will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The Bible, the other version says, the fervent, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. He was just like us. He was just a common man. It didn't rain on the land for there three and a half years. And again, he prayed and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced the crops. My brothers, sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. There's times we get off track, isn't there? Sometimes we get our eyes off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. There's times we get on a road, it's a side road towards self and selfishness and sin. And sometimes someone will pray with us, will share with us, will love us enough to confront us and help us to get back on the path. And today, if any of you need to get back on the path, God is here and instantly will cleanse you and forgive you, remove guilt, remove shame, and bring you close to him. God wants to be close to you. He wants you to walk with him and talk with him. He wants so much a relationship with you. Try The title of the day is Troubled, Happy, and Sick. Uh, I remember the old song, Sick, Sober, and Sorry. Broke, disgusted, and sad. Sick, sober, and sorry. Now look at the fun that we had. <laughs> How many remember that old song? A couple of you people are just as weird as me if you knew that song. That's pretty... I had some weird uncles, I'll tell you that. Well, James is, is, is uh, emphasizing that our life should be a life of a continuous prayer a praise and a prayer. Prayer is listening to God and talking to God, being mindful of God, being attentive to his presence all the time. And in verse 13, the first part of it, he says, he starts off, if any of you in trouble or afflicted. And the word there is really pretty inclusive. It's a, a broad term for hardship. It might be stress in a relationship. It might be uh, worried about something. It might be uh, some sort of a, a decision you're facing or fear or something like that or uh, any kind of distress or difficulty, any kind of trouble, difficulty that you might be facing, you're afflicted. He says, let that person pray. When you encounter or something difficult, go to the Lord in prayer. So many times we go to other people. We talk to this one. We talk to that one. We want to discuss it. We, and, and we worry about it and we mull it over in our head, but we don't take time to actually go and say, God, here's what's going on. Help me. Show me what to do. Give me wisdom. And we pray. And he says, if you've got trouble, you pray. You pray. 
When circumstances bring you low, James says, let God lift you up. Go to him and he will lift you up in your time of trouble. And so throw your heart open to God and say, help me. And then he continues. The next thing he says, the second point is, is, is verse the second part of verse 13 is anyone merry or happy, let him sing songs of praise. The broad term, you're feeling good. I feel good. Mm-hmm. You know that I should. Now. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the rest of the words of that song are good or not. I don't even know what they are. That's all I remember. But when things are going good and you're merry, life is good, sweet, because not always will it be. That's the time to praise God. You got a song. And sometimes guilt and shame and worry, take your song away. Well, you should praise God in the midst of all trouble. But listen, there's times it's easier. There's the good times. If you marry, let him sing a song. Always turn it back to good times and give God the credit, in other words, and praise him. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praise God. Just go ahead and worship the Lord. Brother Lawrence of, in the book, The Practice of the Presence of God, said There's not, there is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than the continual conversation with God. And when God has blessed us, let's give back to him all the sounds of praise. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise you, the Lord. In your walk with God, some struggle. They feel like, you, you know, sometimes you think you've got to pray a long time to take care of this. No, one minute. One minute, just pray a minute or two. Spurgeon said, I hardly ever go without tw- go 20 minutes without a prayer. He's saying it's not about praying long hours. It's about a life of mindfulness and prayer to talk to God, to listen to God, to be listening to his voice, attentive and aware of his nearness and presence. Evangelist John Wesley says about the person of prayer, and I quote, his heart is ever lifted to God at all times and all places. In this, he's never hindered, much less interrupted by any person or thing. In retirement, leisure, business, conversation, his heart is ever with the Lord. Whether he lies down or rises up, God is in his thoughts. He walks with God continually, having the loving eye of his mind still fixed on God and everywhere, seeing the one that's invisible. It's a great adventure to have a daily conversation with God Almighty to walk with him and talk with him, to know his voice, to lean on him in the everlasting arms of love. He says, is any among you troubled, afflicted? Is any among you merry? Is any among you sick? The third thing he says. He says, is any sick? He focuses our attention specifically on this and is literally saying, are you in a state of weakness. It could be emotional, it could be mental, it could be physical, but you're weak. Sometimes you're so weak you can't pray for yourself. You need someone else to pray. You may be suffering from an addiction bound up by a chain, a pattern of a behavior of sin that's got you in bondage. You're, you're sick in some way. And when this situation arises, the Bible tells us to not to pick ourselves up, but it says in verse 14, if any among you sick, he called the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Pray for, call for people to pray. Now some say elder is specifically paid staff pastor. Well, elder is a spiritual person, but Paul talks about not trusting ministry to a novice. So if you're, if you're you know, there, but there are many of you that you've never been called into a full-time ministry position, but you're still, you've got the gifting of the spirit of evangelist or even the gifting of pastor or the gifting of teacher or, or prophet, and you, you, you've got ministries that flow through you and the Holy Spirit is there. And you've walked with God a long time, and you know, you think to yourself, now if I really needed something, I'd call this person and pray. We have several men and women and even younger men and women who, who know how to pray and call on God. And I'm telling you what it's basically saying is what Paul says throughout every one of his, 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 God, his uh, letters to the churches is pray one for another. You see, there are times we need each other to pray for each other. Don't you know that? And sometimes, you know, there's such power in that. And, and, and so to humble yourself and get to a place where you go, man, I need some prayer. Would you please pray for me? And I'm telling you, I've been there many times, and it's wonderful that when you're so weak, you can call on the people, the, the community of faith, the church of Jesus Christ, to come around you and to pray. And trust me, I've done it more than once. And so I urge you to let people pray with you and for you and not to be ashamed of that when we need to pray one for another because we'll all be in that place at one time or another. And then 
in verse 15 of James 5. He says, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he's sinned, he will be forgiven. If you're asked to pray, pray right then. I look online sometimes, someone say, he prayed for this. I, just, I say, praying now is what I always say. And I stop right then because I'm going to forget later. And I'm just, and, you know, you don't have to stop and like pray for an hour. You can be at work even and happen to take a break and see it. Just pray for one minute earnestly and fervently. Just believe God and join in prayer. Can you imagine a hundred people of a church when they see someone in the church needing prayer, that a hundred people stop and pray for one minute each as a hundred minutes and unified praying with compassion in our hearts for it. Ian Bounds says what the church needs today is not more machinery or or, or better machinery, not new organizations or more novel methods, but more people who the Holy Spirit can use, people of prayer, people mighty in prayer and mighty in faith to believe God. And I believe that's true. And if the, it, it, it notice that the verse says here that the Lord will raise him up in verse 15. It is the Lord that raises people up. We pray to who? The God who hears us, and it's the God who hears us that raises people up. It's not the prayer that will raise them up. It's God who will raise them up. We're praying to a God bigger than any tr problem. And when someone asks you to pray, just pause and worship God and think about who you're praying to. You're praying with the one that said, let there be light, and there was light. The one that's the creator of the universe, the one that knows all things, the one that has all power, the one that put that says, I'll remove your sins as far as the east be from the West, the one that said, I will pour out the wrath that hangs over the sins of the world, I will pour it out upon my son. The one that said, it is finished and it is done. The one whose mercy is new every morning. The one who says, I love you unconditionally and my grace is extended to you. This one who is compassionate and passionate about you and you're the apple of his eye and he loves you and he wants to touch you. He wants to heal you and pause and reflect and worship him and then bring your petition to God in faith. R.A. Torrey says, before a word of petition is offered, we should have the definite consciousness that we're talking to God and we should believe that he's listening and is going to grant the things that we ask. The prayer of faith, it says. So we leave it with faith. That doesn't mean we tell God what to do. That's not what faith is. The prayer of faith begins in heaven. And the Holy Spirit quickens it. Let me tell you something. When you pray by faith, you have to have the Holy Spirit because you can't even have faith without the Spirit of God. And so you pray with your words that you understand in English, but they're quickened by the Spirit because the very origination of that faith and the Holy Spirit that God's going to do something comes to you and you hear it from God as you walking with him and talking with him and you're practicing his presence and you go, yes, that is God's will, and it's easy to believe instead of a forced belief of someone you never walk with or talk with. And God who originates it will flow through you to bring it to pass. He is a, a, God, a prayer answering God. And then he goes on, uh, uh, and, and let me just say this. He goes on and he says, and if a person has sinned, he will be forgiven, the last place there in, in James 5.15. And he imagines a situ situation where someone's in chains because they're not forgiven. They're shackled with guilt, with shame, with no joy, no song, and no peace. You remember, Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed, and they brought him down through the ceiling, laid him there, and he was on his mat, and he raised him up. He says, take up your mat and walk. And then he says, your sins are forgiven. And he says, what is it more difficult to say, take, your, take up your mat and walk or to forgive your sins? And the point is, the one that can heal is the one that will forgive. Amen. And so many times, we, we have as much trouble believing we're going to be forgiven as anything else. Listen, God doesn't want you walking out of here in guilt and shame. He wants to bless you and forgive you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all of his benefits who heals all your diseases, and who forgives your iniquities. Bless the Lord. Believe him. Trust him. And this morning when we call people to prayer, you can come and receive forgiveness, and Jesus will be here to forgive you. You can come, and his power will be here to heal you, to free you, to remove guilt and shame. And those of you, any of you, I urge you by the Spirit to follow, be a Spirit-led people to follow. And it doesn't, we don't just have people designated who are the only prayers. No, get up here and pray one for another. That's being a community of faith. Let the Holy Spirit use you. Don't be afraid. Let God work through you to pray one for another. And then he says this, he says, 
confess your sins to each other and pray for each, for each other that you may be healed. Let me tell you something. What that's talking about, listen to me, what's that talking about? If I've sinned against someone, I go to them and ask forgiveness and confess it. If you've sinned with someone, you don't, it's not saying go to the church, get up in front of everybody, confess your sin and whoever you're involved in the sin with. You don't ever, that's, listen, if I've sinned against you, I go to you to ask forgiveness. If you sinned against God, go to God, he'll forgive you. In other words, the formula for forgiveness isn't going and telling the whole world what you did and then going to God and getting forgiveness. Nowhere is it that way. That's not what this is saying. If you sinned against God, go to God. If you sinned against somebody, go to them. And, and then the Lord will bring a fullness of healing. But look at Psalm 32, one to six, it's beautiful, mark it down and meditate on it. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and who, whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, when I didn't confess my sin to God, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. For the day and night your hand was heavy upon me. He's talking to God. Your hand was heavy upon me, God. When I kept silent, I didn't confess my sin to you. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, God, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Do you have sins that's hurt another? Then confess it and ask forgiveness. Do you have sins that are stain, staining your soul, that have stolen your joy, that have brought great guilt and shame and sorrow? Then confess it to God and he will forgive you and cleanse you. God wants to be close to you. He, he gave his son for that very reason, to forgive you. Your, Jesus, over and over again, when he would heal someone, he would say, your faith has made you whole. Then he would say this, and your sins are forgiven, now go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven, now go and sin no more. See, God doesn't want us to use him like some big eraser or some big shower with, the, with the Mr. Clean in it, you know, sudsy Mr. Clean to cleanse us like, so we got to, you know, we don't, he don't want, no, he wants to forgive us and set us free and tell us to turn from our way, our sinful way, our sinful hearts and desires and turn to his way, a way of grace, of truth, of love, of life, of holiness, to turn toward him. And so he says, go and sin no more. And he's saying that to us today, there's forgiveness. And then James motivates us with prayer, the last phrase. He says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful. The effective, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man is, 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 is powerful. It's the NIV, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So if you're troubled, you're happy, you're sick, pray God, pray and also praise God. So what is fervent prayer? This, this verse uh, uh, the Amplified teaches us through the same scripture that there's a tremendous power available for the righteous who pray fervently. In the Amplified, it says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of righteous, the righteous men makes tremendous power available, dynamic in his working. If you want tremendous power available, then the heartfelt, the word, the word, the, if the, the fervent, that word fervent, I looked it up, it has to do with passion. That's the center of the word. And it has to do with expressing yourself from deep within you and crying out to God. In Hebrews chapter five, verse seven, the Bible talks, and you, you wanna write this down because some of you have never seen this in this light. It talks about Jesus himself who was praying who in the days of his flesh, in other words, he's on earth as a man. That's what it's saying, Hebrews 5, 7. When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, this is Jesus, strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. See, Jesus, while he was on earth, you go back to that word and it means loud, powerful, violent, forcible, strong, passionate. That's what it's talking about, fervent, a fire, a passion, something burns in you. And I'm telling you, you get to a place where you're desperate, you'll go to God and you'll cry out to God. How many times in the psalmist said, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. I'm telling you, there's something about being desperate and going after God and crying out to God with a heartfelt prayer. 
And so it, that's very important. And then uh, the effectual fervent prayer, the, the availeth much. It, two things that word availeth. It means, it's, it, it means it brings about God's will in heaven, but it also means it honors God. In other words, faith that prays this way is honoring God, whether or not what we pray for and believe God for comes to pass or not. How many of you are with me there? Because there are times we don't understand we're not God. But it's not wrong to pray what your heart's desire is, to try to get in the presence of God, the Spirit of God, and to pray for something powerful to happen. You know, Martin Luther, uh, he said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but it's, it's, uh, he says, it's laying hold of God's willingness so if you're troubled, you're afflicted, pray. If you're uh, blessed and joyful, be happy and praise God in song and glorify him. If you're sick or, sick or weak or chained up with uh, feeling unforgiven, ask to be prayed for. God will forgive you and heal you. And if you ask to be prayed, if someone asks you to pray for him, by all means, pray and pray then. We want to be a church family that trusts God, that prays to God regularly, that practices prayer and praise as a lifestyle, a natural outflow of walking and talking with God. It mentions at the end, as I close, Elijah, who was a man of like passions, that he prayed in three and a half years, it didn't rain, and then he prayed again and it rained. He's just like you and I. What is it saying? It's saying the one we pray to, God is the one that does it. And he says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man. Let me tell you something. Je uh, Matthew 6.33 says, seek first. Listen to me, everybody. This is something you've never heard. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is not seeking first the kingdom of God and the blood of Christ that's, that is uh, in position that makes us righteous before God. That's not what that's talking about. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. When he says the fervent prayer of a righteous man here, he's not talking about the blood of Christ has cleansed you and you're saved so you're all righteous. There's a difference in a position of righteousness through faith and grace through Jesus Christ by the blood that in God's eyes you are saved and headed to heaven and Jesus has taken the penalty of your sin and, and his sin was upon him. But here, all in the Sermon on the Mount, which Matthew 6, is on, he's talking about acts of righteousness. He's talking about behavior and attitude and heart. Listen to me. What does he say when you pray? You pray like this, you talking about heart. When you give, give like this, you talk about the heart, not so the people will be boasting, look at, look at me. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's about God. He's talking about how you treat your enemies. You love your enemies. Even those that use you, you pray for them, right? He's talking about, Jesus talks about, if, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, he said, you've done it under the least one of these. If you clothe or feed them, he says, if you ask to go to a mile, he says, go two miles, turn the other cheek, let it be. We sent off this morning, Tim and Doris Eckert, they leave tomorrow to Indonesia and they're going to minister to Muslims. These communities where we gave water is for Muslims. You see that? And lots of them, it's turning whole villages around to Jesus. And the thing of it is, is there have been times I've been so disgusted in my heart against people that call themselves Christians and the way they behave with the hatred in their hearts. And I'm telling you, what Jesus calls us to is a right heart, doesn't he? Right? And let me tell you something. Whether it's a heathen, a Buddhist, a Muslim, I don't care who they are, the heart is that they need Jesus and we're to pray for them. And the trouble that I'm seeing in our culture today, because you have a lot of things going on apart from the Holy Spirit of God, which is fruit is love, is that you're getting a lot of people filled with a lot of anger, and a lot of hate going all kinds of directions. And that is not the spirit of Christ in us. There are people that are angry when a person goes to a mission field that's all to Muslims because they just flat out hate Muslims. That is biblically wrong. That is not the heart of Jesus. Do you hear me? Did you know that Muslims themselves, many of them, are very much hate and despise those murderous ISIS people and other groups like that? Did you know that Muslims that are ISIS kill more Muslims than anybody else? They're killing each other because they hate each other because that sect of them is horrible. And I, don't, I, I, used, to, I used to have some misperceptions, I suppose, but having traveled to London and other places, I'm a talker, man. I'll talk to anything and anybody. I'll talk to this plant and it's not even real. <laughs> so I talked to several of them and they told me 
that they were so ashamed of these people that are doing this in the name of their God. I shared Jesus. I'm gonna tell you, hundreds and hundreds of Muslims around the world are coming to Jesus. We support missionaries and give money to bring them to Jesus. And while I don't want to get involved with national decisions and all that, what I do want to be careful is my church, the church that I pastor, is that you understand my heart, that we are to love all people. I don't care how heathen they are. I don't care about their false gods that they follow. We are to love them and pray for them and witness to them and in your neighborhoods, wherever they are. And I understand that I, I understand all of the different yeah, buts, yeah, but I get that. And I'm not making a political statement at all. I'm not. I'm not meaning to do that. What I'm meaning to say is we need to keep loving our hearts and pray for people that are lost. Are you with me? Because that's, you know, we talk about the righteous man. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. All through the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about acts of righteousness, behavior of acting righteous. It's your behavior, not your standing of righteousness. And that's what he's talking about. And I'm telling you, when our hearts are right, filled with his spirit, filled with his love, filled with faith, then God's gonna, it's God's gonna quicker come and hear, hear his cry. How many of you think Jesus died for people that are in, in false religions? Do you think that? How many think he didn't die for people in false religions? Okay. Do you think he died for every person? Whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not by gender, not by race, not by social economic status, not by where they live or anything else. And we need to have a heart for every person that they come to Christ because Christ is the answer. And let me tell you something. I told you this at the very beginning of the political process before anybody was even nominees. We didn't even know who the two nominees were gonna be. And I keep saying it, and I want to say it again. America's got a sin problem. They got a heart problem. And no political process is going to change America, only God. If my people will humble themselves and pray here and call upon my name, turn from their own sin, then I'll hear and I'll answer and I'll heal their land. Let me tell you something. It's us praying. And you, can't, you cannot touch heaven for our nation if you're full of hatred. So you can stand for truth and walk in love but you can't get caught up with the hatred. Now, I, I, I watched, you know, sometimes I'll get to watch and I, I'll watch five minutes on this who seems to have a persuasion in the news and I'll watch this news. So, and then this one, that one. I'm going, man, this is so weird. This is so weird. And, and I personally, I think that both of them are breeding hatred beyond measure in our culture. Stay away from it. Walk in love. Walk in the truth. Pray. That's the only answer. Are you with me? I want you to be righteous because I want God to answer our prayers, amen? amen. And the, the devil wants to cause division. Do you know we're having people saved that have never been in church, they don't know anything about God. You tell them about Elijah, like I, they, you say Elijah, they, what, what's Elijah, who was that? What did he do? All we know is what was here, they don't know anything. I'll tell you, when people come to Christ, the enemy wants to divide. And together we stand, the divided we fall. I'm gonna tell you, there's a unity of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, the power of God's Spirit, the power to change lives, to heal bodies, to do all kinds of things, it comes when we're together. And the uni uni unified body of Christ is not in perfect agreement of doctrine. It's surely nothing to do with perfect agreement in politics. It is an agreement of God's Word and Jesus Christ and His Spirit and power that we believe God and walk together and love each other despite maybe some differences that we have. Amen? God is still God. He's on the throne. And I, I, my heart, honestly, always has been, I want more than anything else to see people come and bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Will you bow your head with me? Three things this morning as we sing, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forgives all my sins and heals all my, my, my diseases. My, forgives my iniquities and heals my diseases. If you're sick, we want to pray for you. If you're troubled in any way, got trouble in any kind, relationally, you name it, come and pray, cry out to God, hear for wisdom. And if, if you feel like there's sins between you and God, God offers forgiveness today. We invite you to come. Will you stand with me as we begin to sing this? And those that are here and you say, I don't need to come for any of that, would you come as the Holy Spirit would lead you and pray with others? And can we be honest and pull down the mask here a little bit? Okay, if, if you're dealing with hatred, you're really angry, you're angry inside, like, you know, I'm not, I have not meant, and if you've heard it, then that's not what I meant to make any kind of political statement here. 
What I'm trying to do is make a Jesus statement. <laughs> you love everybody, pray for people, okay? Don't be mean, don't be filled with hate, okay? You with me? Jesus in us, Opa glory. God wants to move. We need to be a people of prayer.